What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard of business, a dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're engaged, and we like to get scared together. Never get sick of hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> Today, we're going to keep talking about creepy kids. Yeah, this is part two. Yeah, it's our first two-parter. This has never happened before. No, but that's what happens when you print out a stack of uh, notes that yeah. could probably be published. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Well, I, to be fair, a lot of, actually all of my notes are, it's a compilation of other people's already done amazing work. I've got all the sources in the description. This is episode specifically is going to be basically a, a summary of this amazing book, The Uncanny Child in Transnational Cinema. Um, and I have the author in the description. I just, I, I'm like, I don't know how to pronounce her last name and I'm afraid of like messing it up over and over again. Is it the one that you tried? Yes. Jessica Balen, Balenzategui. That sounds Jessica Balanza Tegui. She's a she's a professor and this book was an open source PDF. Like it's available online. And her book is what I used to talk we're, we're gonna talk mostly today about like turn of the millennium horror and specifically Japanese and Spanish horror from around then because there's lots of creepy kids going on. And I that was a, a subject I didn't know a ton about, and this book is an amazing look at what's going on in those movies and how those movies differ in terms of why they have creepy kids versus why Americans do. Okay. It's why this became a two-parter, because when you look at why we have creepy kids in American movies, which is what we spent our whole last episode talking about, the reasons behind or the, the things informing these other countries and cultures having kids in their horror films. It's different. Like they're, they're in, uh, informed by different things and different historical traumas and different, you know, so we look at American history and we have, for example, the oil crisis in the seventies is informing Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So when you start to look at horror films from other countries, you inevitably have to learn about the history of other places like the all the rules of dissecting American horror just kind of goes out the window so that's why this became a whole other part because there's so much more to talk about with these other countries films yeah and that's the thing is just growing up I always had an interest in American history it's been always been one of my favorite subjects and so that's really helped inform me as you know we've gone along these podcasts to be able to understand the context surrounding American horror films as they come out. I don't know history in other countries as well, and it's one of the reasons that I haven't approached uh, foreign horror films as much on the channel as, you know, maybe I should or maybe other people would like me to. I don't feel as equipped to do it, and judging by how much time you spent on this episode, clearly it would take a lot of effort and time to just prepare myself to be able to talk about these things in an informed manner. Right. Like I feel like I can with American horror films. Right. Because it's one thing to talk about the movies. And we could have just done like a cursory glance at some of these movies. But I think that's a bit unfair when so much of this podcast is going in depth into American movies. And I don't think it would be fair to like not give other countries horror the same treatment. So I'm going to do my best here. Again, this is like stuff I'm not as well informed on mm -hmm. and that's why I haven't really touched it yet and I did I I have used I'm using this book as a guide so this is kind of a like a, a summary of a few different chapters of her book this isn't her whole book but it's a few essays within her book that I think are really really good so like please go look at it and and let her know she's on Twitter uh, if you enjoyed this episode, if you enjoy her work, if you're going to, you know, take a look at the book and download it yourself. When did that book come out? Recent, because um, she, t at the end, is talking about Stranger Things and stuff. Oh, okay. Like that, so, so yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't have to worry about it. Reading it and feeling like, oh, this is old-fashioned. That's like the thing is some of my sources, like, 
last episode we used the monster show by david j skull and that book ends in like 1990 something like it's it's dated yeah um but it's still very good unfortunately there is some stuff in it that like there's some transphobic stuff that feels very of its age but it's still a very very good book worth reading sure Uh, And also maybe people watching or listening who are either from the countries we're going to be discussing or have studied the histories of those countries. Oh, and there are because I was tweeting about it and people were like, oh, I'm a history major. I know what you're going to. Yeah. Yeah. So so please help inform the discussion through comments. Yeah. If I'm, you know, misinformed, (laughs) if I'm, you know, getting there, but I'm a little off, feel free to. Yeah. Start a conversation in the comments. Yeah, we're always interested in learning more or correcting erroneous thoughts that we may have. For sure. So, yeah, going into the late 90s and early 2000s, the turn of the millennium, this era is kind of supernatural. Lots of either ghost kids or we have ghost-like kids. Uh, Samara, I feel like, is kind of ghost-like-ish. Yeah, what is she? I guess she's a ghost. Isn't she a ghost? Yeah. Or maybe um, Cole from The Sixth Sense feels oh. very... You know, just where they have they have the ability to commune with spirits. Yeah, he's stuff. one of those conduit kids, mm-hmm. like Danny or Carol Ann. Yes, they, they have a lot of... Uh, they have a lot in common with that era of horror. So it's interesting to kind of, if again, if you haven't listened to that episode last week, go back and listen to it where we talk about the 80s creepy kid and how they're just like a weird kid. They're not evil, but they can commune with the other side and stuff. And so that's where we're going to get these kind of updated versions of those characters in these newer movies. But when we get into this like, transnational cinema when we get into movies that aren't American especially Japanese and Spanish films the child kind of functions as a symbol of repressed historical trauma which I think is really interesting the idea of like a suppressed collective trauma that like the culture at large exactly that everyone has experienced together because everyone as a country has gone through this thing together and that's informing the present so that's what those kids kind of come to symbolize. So they, in those movies, the children, they defy this image of being innocent. They have agency and they aren't helpless or subordinate. So that's, we get um, more outwardly, maybe even evil kids like Sadako, who it's not Samara in the ring. Oh, okay. Sadako is in the the Japanese version, the original version. Is, Ringu. Yes, exactly. And so they kind of, you know, whether they're American or they're from Japan or Spain, all these kids at the turn of the millennium kind of demonstrate this unease we all have now, at, um, like coming up on the year 2000, looking back at the way we define childhood and how much we project onto kids. Like we've said before, you know, the idea of children are the future. That idea in the end is serving adults. It's not serving the kids. This is like, how are these children going to further progress the system that we've set up, you know, by positioning them as future adults. Mm -hmm. So combine our kind of unease with realizing what happens when we set kids on this like rigid path to adulthood and like telling them this is what you will be when you are older and you are are born into this world where you have to uphold this end of a social contract. You have no choice. Mm -hmm. Combine that with just the anxiety of moving into the 2000s. That was if you were around for it. Like we were kids then, which is interesting talking about this. We were the age that some of the the creepy kids are in these movies, which I think is kind of fun. But, uh, you know, I, I think that was on a lot of people's minds, this idea of, what is the future going to be like for our kids? It, I think it was so at the forefront. Yeah, because just reaching the year 2000, I think, uh, consciously or not, makes people think of these big, almost existential thoughts and like species-wide thoughts. Because I remember, you know, I was a kid. I was, what, 10, 11 years old mm-hmm. then. And it, just being like, having the realization that, oh, uh, we're, we're about to hit the year 2000, what about when we hit the year 3000 and then like kind of just working out like, 
oh no, that'll I'll never see that. That's so far mm-hmm. in the future. Like I'm not even gonna see 2100. And just like hitting that big round number and being like, humans have been doing history for 2,000 years, I guess. Yeah, yeah, you're. Right. It is like, oh, we're mortal, and this machine is just gonna keep going without us. Exactly. And- yeah, you never really think about, uh, you know, especially as a kid, you don't often think about how humans uh, are, you know, that that blink of the Earth's time span. But when you're hitting the year 2000, and it's like, oh, we've been around. J- 2000 10. i mean obviously longer than that oh, yeah but uh yeah it just makes you think damn it, it's not a long time and it's uh pretty insignificant yeah and i think the just this time period and kind of subconsciously or not making everyone think about aging and childhood especially what is childhood what are kids of the future gonna be like uh it informs all these movies coming out. We've got like The Sixth Sense comes out. Uh, and Let's see. The Orphanage is a bit later, but The Devil's Backbone is 2001. Ringu, Ju on the Grudge. Like all these movies have these kids in them. It's like a weird global thing. And by the way, it's uh, The Sixth Sense was the second highest grossing film of 1999. And do you want to guess what the... The Matrix. No, not The Matrix. No, what? Not The Matrix. 1999. If you want to guess. The Matrix was 99, though. I'm pretty sure. Not the top grossing. Unless it was 2000. Uh, I think The Matrix was 99. Think of the podcast episode we're doing. Why would I put this here? What was the top grossing film? 99 mm-hmm. in the U.S.? Uh, I be- Yeah, I believe. I just have like second highest grossing. I didn't specify, but I think it is U.S. I don't know. The Phantom Menace, 1999. Oh, fucking of course. Another creepy kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it, it's on the brain. It's like Obviously. in our, it is in our global consciousness. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Yeah. So Yeah, like you could swap those actors and you'd have different movies, but like they, they probably went to the same casting calls. Oh, for sure. You know, Jake Lloyd and- uh, Sandy Blonde Child with Mushroom Cut. Yeah, right this which way. I could have fucking played. Uh-huh. I could have been Anakin. You would have been a great Anakin. Thanks, baby. honey. I've always thought so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're continuing into the new millennium, this fixation that we talked about in the 80s with this child abuse panic uh, scandal, like the daycare scandal, satanic panic. That's still informing, you know, I remember, um, and I'm even thinking, you know, this is tied to satanic panic, but like West Memphis three, uh, Damien Eccles that Mm. he, uh, I remember my, my parents were freaked out by that case specifically. Like I remember when that was going on and what's that? Well, at this point, by like the year 2000, the Catholic Church has got to be a factor yes, too. Yes, right? absolutely. Because when did that bubble that up? That would surface? have been. Uh, I'm trying to think when that was. I'm not sure, but it would have been right around here. Maybe I feel like a my after. whole childhood, I was aware of that going on, yes. especially because we were in the both of us we were, were raised in the Catholic, Catholic Church. Yeah, so there's that too. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So like, there's still this this fear and fixation over um yeah child abuse um not being able to trust who we could previously to raise our kids Mm -hmm. i think as a result of all these years of just assuming that childhood is now this time of trauma like now childhood is a time where everyone gets their repressed traumas from i feel like now it's kind of a given that you have if you look back at your childhood, like everyone's got something that they're repressing or dealing with. It's like why, you you know, it's kind of a jokey image, but you go into therapy and it's okay. Tell me about your childhood because we all just kind of assume now that that's where you've got some shit going on. (laughs) That's informing who you are as an adult. And so when you look at these creepy kid films from the new millennium, the, especially the American ones, they are adults kind of, trying to figure out what's up with these kids that are in these movies so the sixth sense is like the one we're going to focus on because i think it's such a perfect distillation of like this weird this like new trend of kid because when you think about what the storytelling mechanic is of the sixth sense and the big twist of it it is a complete reflection of the idea of like oh 
adults have this inner child that was like traumatized and figuring out what happened to this kid is going to reveal something about the adult. Yeah. Which is exactly what happens in the sixth sense. We learn because I, I, it's been so long since I've watched that movie. I really need to rewatch it is Bruce Willis. I know he's a ghost at the end, but throughout the film, is he a doctor? See, like, is he a psychologist? Or yes. Some sort? He, I think he, yeah. And I, I should have rewatched it for this, but I didn't have time. Mm -hmm. But um, I think he is a yeah he's a, he's a psychiatrist because his patient is who comes and kills him I believe at the oh. beginning oh okay yeah wow which we don't learn until <laughs> the end but yeah so yeah right it's it's kind of the added layer of like he also is a psychiatrist I think adding some legitimacy to this theory that mm -hmm. it's about the like interpreting your inner kid and stuff so but yeah like the sixth sense we learn that Cole who is the little boy can see dead people. And therefore, by learning what's making this little kid tick, you are then revealing something about the adult. Bruce Willis has been dead the whole ooh, time. Okay. Right. Isn't that? I like that's that. Fun, I think that's yeah. pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, ooh, I like that. I, I can't take credit for that. That's all this this book. Mm -hmm. um, so then you have the, in essence, that's the uh, uncanny child, as she calls them, as kind of a vessel for the adult character's trauma. And again, this is like American cinema. It's yeah. very like the individual. Um, another example of this is, this isn't quite new millennium, but I think it's, uh, I loved her bit about this movie is insidious is another movie that functions in that way. Uh, it's the same kind of device. The character, the kid character is what in turn reveals something about the That's adult. Right, yeah. yeah. So Dalton, who I mean, we did a commentary track about insidious and we had so much fun ragging on Dalton because who names their kid Dalton? If you're a Dalton. Uh, comment below. Yeah, let us know, Dalton's. How's yeah? How's it going? Like, how's it being a Dalton? Yeah, what's it like being, being a Dalton? A Dalton. <laughs> uh, so Dal better than the kid who fucking disappears. Yeah, I don't even remember that kid's name. I don't remember that kid's name because he fucking disappears halfway through the movie. Yeah, Dalton's brother. And I mean, literally, like they forgot he was in the script. Yeah, I yeah. think they're like, oh, he's our grandma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. ADR line <laughs> comes like. back. What the. <laughs> <laughs> so Dalton, who's Patrick Wilson's kid, falls into a coma early in the movie. And the image of a kid in a coma in and of itself is really unsettling because when we think of like what is a kid, the, especially the way we've been positioning it throughout these episodes, we're like, kid is future adult. So a kid, in essence, the way we frame them is like someone who's always growing. A kid means being a kid means transition. You are growing. You are aging. Uh, so a kid kind of frozen in time is very unsettling. Yeah, just the stasis. Mm -hmm. So they have to go to the further to find Dalton, which is described as a realm like ours, but it's beyond our reach. And it's a place without time. So the child in this movie kind of occupies that space, which is like always there. And it's outside of our adults grasp in that movie, which is kind of an interesting representation of like childhood and childhood trauma. Like. Oh, which is why Patty Wilson has to go into it. He has to revisit. He has to revisit his, his childhood trauma, trauma by entering the further. Exactly, and I just see. it's also the idea of like childhood is like as an adult you realize i want to look back and understand what childhood is like when you're a child you're not aware of it on the same level that an adult is where you're like wait what is happening when you're a kid but it's impenetrable you can never be a kid again like yeah. you can never fully understand what that's like um so yeah uh they have to go into the further and that's when we realized patrick wilson was also he was able to astral project and stuff as a kid and that movie's weird <laughs> there's a lot going on in that movie and that yeah i love the little kid in that is it dalton who's running around in that creepy little sailor boy suit or is that a different kid? i think that's just a ghost kid it's just a ghost kid mm -hmm. so moving on to spanish horror at this time instead of the movies we've talked about where it's the relationship between the inner kid and the present adult the creepy kid in these is representing a more broad historical trauma, so national trauma. So children in these millennial Spanish horror films represent this repressed memories of the Spanish Civil War, which is very, it's far, like that was in the 30s. Yeah, 36 to 39. Yes. So like right before World War II really <laughs> broke out. Right, and you might be thinking, well, 
how do these millennial films represent that Mm -hmm. that was so long ago it would be like films it'd be like the sixth sense is about the great Great depression Depression, and here's why (laughs) like that would be crazy right Mm -hmm. but yeah like i kind of said at the beginning of the episode this is you know what happens when you go into learning about another country's horror especially you have to really look into their history and to maybe an american it would seem weird that something so far in the past would be informing these millennial horror films like that would make sense in America where we've always had freedom of speech we've always been able to pretty much make movies about whatever barring like you know the studio codes and stuff but we could make things with social commentary we can criticize the government um but in Spain that was not the case for a very long time after the Spanish Civil War so the Spanish Civil War was a this is going to be like a really distilled simple explanation of it but it basically was a civil war between the Republicans which is not Republicans as we think of them in America yeah. this is like leftist groups uh versus the like monarchists um conservatives nationalists it basically is like a left v right split i think literally in the wikipedia article it says uh this was the dress rehearsal for world war ii in 1936 general francisco franco led a military uprising against spain's elected left-wing government he embraced fascism here he is meeting hitler german planes bombed spanish cities to help him but not like left versus right in like american terms no more in like you know like democracy as a form of government representation right uh and then on the other side more like a authoritarian right yeah and so in this civil war the authoritarians win that civil war and that's when we have the franco dictatorship he led the the nationalists so because we have this dictatorship installed there's severe limitations on what people can say like artistic expression movies so spanish cinema is super weird when you look at it throughout the 20th century spain had a big exploitation film boom weirdly in the late 60s through the which is the end of the dictatorship i think they started loosening up censorship laws a tiny bit and so people just like took that and ran as far as they could and so what happens is you have filmmakers like guillermo del toro who did the devil's backbone he's an adult and grew up as a kid like right after the war is, or after the dictatorship is like not like he Franco dies in like 70 something and so then you have all these decades of people first like trying to we're not we're not talking about what happened it's kind of like we're try, we're gonna move on and just not talk about it and we're not gonna like deal with this as a country we're just gonna like you know we'll pretend that it's all fine so then you have kids who grow up into adults who grew up during this time of like well wait we can't just not talk about this so then you have these adults making films like the devil's backbone that are addressing this kind of repression and how that affects children especially because he was a kid growing oh, up during okay. that yes all right yeah yeah and like i said in the last episode there's who can kill a child in 1976 is this really important spanish horror film this comes out five months after franco's death he realized i have that written down oh wow and like i mentioned it begins with this montage of historical atrocities done to children with numbers of like dead kids mm-hmm. the spanish civil war is not included oh, but okay. it is casting its shadow over the whole movie and so therefore if you're looking if you're interpreting the film in that way you remember how i said that movie the reasoning for these kids killing all the adults on this island is never given Mm -hmm. the like by excluding the civil war as part of that montage at the beginning it's then this kind of invisible specter that is maybe what's making the kids do this okay yeah yeah it's like this this unspoken thing it's this like unseen character almost so and the director at the time quote i don't like talking about the message of a film but i think in the case of my film this is easy to understand if the children are cruel and they rebel against the adults they are not to blame we are to blame we talked about that a bit the idea of these this like feral kid movies where it's kids in packs killing adults is a, a weird revenge film subgenre almost. Yeah. So in the year 2000, the Association for the Recuperation of Historical Memory is formed, which is this group who has the goal of collecting testimonies of victims of the Civil War and the dictatorship, which up to that point, 
either so until the like you know late 70s is not allowed we can't we don't talk about that Mm -hmm. or even after the war it's just this unspoken thing oh yeah we're all just trying to like tamp it down and move past it but around the turn of the millennium people are like well wait let's we need to like get you know let this out as better do it now too because by that point the people who were alive then were probably getting pretty old you know right that especially the civil war part yeah exactly exactly so the historical memory law is passed in 2007 by Prime Minister Jose Luis Zapatero, which it recognizes victims on both sides of the Civil War, but it does condemn the Franco regime and it removes plaques commemorating the regime and the dictatorship from public buildings. So now we're removing things that were put up after the Civil War okay. in support of the dictatorship. So we're finally on a national level. We have the Prime Minister saying, OK, we're going to start publicly airing this out and publicly moving on and addressing it. As the search for victims continues, the Spanish Prime Minister Jose Zapatero, whose own grandfather was killed by a firing squad during the Civil War, says he wants to redress the grievances of those forgotten during the country's dash to democracy. You know, when you first started talking about like removing these uh, plaques and, and I don't think it says statues, but it made me think uh, for instance, Confederate statues being taken down or whatever. I don't think it's the same thing. Uh, it's not quite the same thing because the Confederacy didn't win. That Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is the same idea of like, can we finally now talk about this and talk about getting rid of these things? Yeah, I think that's the difference is uh, because in Spain, it sounds like there was this agreement to just not talk about that. Whereas in America... You know, Civil War is frequently talked about. The Confederacy is frequently talked about. Right. Yeah. I'm just trying to it is in- yeah, I, I contextualize of, it from my I thought of that too, American though. This, perspective. this movement we've seen, you know, especially recently of getting rid of these monuments and stuff. It's not like over the years people haven't tried to do that, but it's just been in the news, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's not a coincidence that these creepy kids, Spanish horror films are coming out around the year 2000 when we have Spain publicly dealing with this after so much time, just not. So the kid characters in these films are really confronting these narratives of national progress and forced healing, you know, the idea of like, if we all just agree we're cool, then we can all move on and be fine. Yeah. It's a very surface level healing. You're never going to get better that way. It's just we're burying stuff. Yeah. Uh, to again relate it to an American perspective, it f- kind of feels in that way like Reconstruction and oh, yeah. you know, post-Civil War, how like Reconstruction just kind of ended with that that. Uh, election that corrupt yeah. bargain and then it was just like le- okay listen you're free let's just move on that's because what was it it was like okay we'll let you have the, the presidency the, if you if we move out of the south out of the, if, yeah oh that if was you right. take like union forces out of the south and quit forcing us to you know follow your guidelines and continue reconstruction it was the end of reconstruction mm. uh and that gave way to you know all the jim crow laws and everything right yeah. and that's something that i think You know, apart from like the narrative of the Civil War in general, I think Reconstruction might be harder to talk about because it just it acknowledges, oh, the North did some really fucked up shit, too. Right. Like we pulled out and left all these people in the South to kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a political agreement. Yes. But it's just having to reconcile with that had really devastating consequences. And so there's gray areas Mm -hmm. in the Civil War, too. So let's talk about The Devil's Backbone, which came out in 2001, directed by Guillermo del Toro, okay. who is like, I think, the kind of figurehead for this era of you know, kids in horror in terms of them representing the Spanish history and coming to terms with so pan's labyrinth is. yeah that's what i was gonna say yeah yeah yeah. pan's labyrinth she this author talked about pan's labyrinth a bit she focused more on devil's backbone because it's more outwardly a horror pan's labyrinth is a bit more it's like fantasy yeah drama it yeah. has scary moments for sure for sure but yeah so the the or, or not the orphanage we're gonna <laughs> talk about that but so the devil's backbone is set in an orphanage of boys from republican families the losing side of the civil war in mm-hmm. spain 
and this orphanage is in the middle of a desert and there is a unexploded bomb in the middle of the courtyard. It is literally like a cartoon missile just like sitting in the (laughs) middle of this courtyard and the bomb is apparently diffused. All the adults say it's diffused, but the kids all have this story they tell each other where if you get close up enough and you put your ear against it, you can hear it ticking and it's going to go off someday. So they're all freaked out by it. Oh, wow. Yeah. The orphanage is also haunted by the ghost of a child named Santi who, so you have this possibly ticking bomb and Santi who is going around and he's constantly saying many of you will die that's like his his thing <laughs> that's his line that's his thing yeah <laughs> we, i like how it's it's a qualified statement it's not you're all gonna die it's like many, many of you, of will, you die. will die yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we see this representation of a past that is being repressed and downplayed by all the adults especially with the bomb all yeah. the adults are like it's fine it's safe it's not gonna blow up but all these kids are like dude we can't we we can't we can't have a bomb and it's gonna explode <laughs> and all the adults making them feel like they're overreacting or they're crazy and santi being a ghost is important too because like all the uncanny kids we've talked about he's kind of he's a haunting of the present by the past yeah i mean can't get a better representation of the past than a ghost right 2007 we have the orphanage by j.a bayona yes Mm -hmm. who directed uh fallen kingdom yeah and the directing in that movie is the best part of it yeah yeah i'm I'm sad he's not making the next one yeah so the orphanage is is a little bit past the new millennium or Mm -hmm. a few years into it but 2007 is also the year that that uh previously mentioned historical memory law passed by the prime minister came into effect we're just a reminder it's the we're recognizing both sides of the victims of the civil war we're, we're officially condemning the franco regime we're taking down monuments and stuff so i think it's very important to note like these movies came out the exact same year in the orphanage a woman named laura moves into a building that's formerly the orphanage that she grew up in and she was adopted from. She moves in with her adopted son, Simone, and Simone befriends a ghost named Thomas, who... Tomas. Tomas. <laughs> yeah, I just realized it'd be Tomas, who lived in the orphanage at the same time Laura did, but Laura didn't know he existed. Oh, yeah, man. So Laura and Simone get in an argument, and Simone goes missing. She can't find him. Laura's looking for him, and then that's when she learns about Tomas and how right after Laura was adopted, the other kids find Tomas, who has been hidden away in the cellar because he has like a facial deformity, so he always wears this little like sack mask. That's the imagery I, I like I know from this and that sticks out from that movie. It's that little sack mask, and so the other kids steal his mask, and he's so humiliated that he hides in a nearby cave, and then he's drowned by the tide as it mm-hmm. comes in. Mm-hmm. So Tomas's mother, who's a nurse at the facility, is so angry obviously that she then poisons the food of all the kids at the orphanage so all these ghosts of these kids haunt this building that laura now lives in she has no idea that this happened (laughs) and so this this discovery of laura by of uh, this discovery of laura um of all these kids and this discovery of the dead and like realizing this horrible thing happened reflects this all the unaddressed dead on this other side of the civil war that we so long we're just not addressing and weren't allowed to address. I believe there was a people were allowed to exhume mass graves and stuff and get, yeah, because they're just unmarked graves. We're now allowed to exhume them, move properly, bury people. Yeah. Right. Wow. Okay. So, and yeah, again, it's why it's important to note this movie comes out that same year that that law. So yeah, they're literally discovering the dead on the other side of the civil war that lost and this movie is about like discovering the dead yeah. uh, kids that were previously repressed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and things you didn't even realize happened because no, you were never told. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, even though you grew up there. Yeah. You grew up in the country in the orphanage. Right, and her not knowing or not fully realizing at least the extent of the trauma that happened in this building is what ends up killing. Simone because she keeps insisting that Tomas isn't real because Tomas appears to Simone as an imaginary friend Mm -hmm. and she didn't even she wouldn't have known about the room that Tomas lived in because she didn't know he existed and that's where Laura ultimately finds Simone because Simone was hiding in there 
And while Laura was looking for Simone, she blocks off that door. She like moves some stuff. That's right. Simone gets trapped and he dies in there. So oh, her man. by her ignoring the full history of this building, the full truth of it. She doesn't know this door is there. She inadvertently kills her kid. Yeah, her kid, the future. Right, exactly. She kills him by ignoring the past. Yeah, right. Wow. Yeah. Hattie. Really Hattie stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese horror films with creepy kids at the turn of the millennium also reckon with these ideas of national identity. So you, we talked a little bit about Japan. I don't know how much I'm going to end up editing this episode, but we talked about just the idea of being living in a country where like if you're japan you are on the bad side of the of world war ii you are objectively the bad guys in a global conflict and everyone knows it yeah. so japan has a lot of reckoning to do here with that side of their history in japanese films two technologies intertwined with the progression of time so sadako obviously uses her vhs tapes to spread her curse and in 1998 that's the standard of Home entertainment. But I feel like, because VHS is what came out in the 80s, and I feel like that's when Japan is bumping. In yeah. the 80s, Japan was thought of as like, oh, they're going to surpass America yeah. as a technological and economic powerhouse. So it's, I think it's really like purposeful that she uses VHS tapes. They're really like symbolic of this is the boom time of Japan's economy. But when Japan's economy crashes in the early 90s up through like the next decade, I think I through think, the early 2000s. It's, I think it almost extended two decades because I know it's called the lost, the lost decade. decade. Yeah. 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 It's I think it VHS in 1998 is like that's the tail end of VHS. It is. DVD is yeah. about to replace it. And it, it is interesting how that kind of is a neat parallel to yeah, Japan's boom versus its bust in the lost decade, hmm. the shift in technology. It's worth noting, too, how beloved Sadako is in Japan. Like, And this is, uh, Sadako is, is equivalent Samara. to Samara. Sadako yeah. is Samara. Um, Sadako is her name in Ringu, the original Japanese version. Uh, we're going to talk about the importance of her name, too, which I find really fascinating. This transnational cinema book has all these figures, uh, which I, I had to include because they're so interesting. She's originally from a novel. It's just it's Ring by Koji Suzuki in 1991. She's been in eight Japanese features, two American remakes, an American reboot. And a Korean remake, which I did not know existed. Two Japanese TV series, anime made for TV movie, 11 manga, two video games, a radio drama. And in 2014, Sanrio, who makes all the Hello Kitty stuff, made a line of Sadako stuff. And I want it really. <laughs> I was looking at- <laughs> Is it at, in the same aesthetic style? It's Hello Kitty dressed as Samara coming out of the well. I want <laughs> all of that shit. It's so cute. She has little bows in her long hair, and I oh, it's so funny. Yeah, so they love Sadako. She's so cherished. She's thrown the opening pitches at baseball games. Baseball's huge in Japan. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And in 2002, when the American remake came out, a uh, bar like a quote-unquote burial, it was like a ceremony was held for Sadako to mourn the fact that she was no longer solely Jap or Japan's child. Aww. She didn't, she's not, you know, she is in a way owned by Hollywood now. She is not their yeah. own unique thing anymore. We yeah. took her and uh, let Lilo play her. That's right, yeah. <laughs> the voice actor for Lilo from Lilo and Stitch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, by the way, just to in case people are wondering, I, I do want to talk about American remakes of foreign horror. That's its own episode. Oh, for I, sure. I was going to maybe talk a little, but I was like, nope, we're getting mm -hmm. into two because it is really interesting and it's it's related to this stuff, which is why I almost included it. But it's the idea of like when you remake something that is a foreign film and it's all the stuff I've I've mentioned where it's so it's different history informing it. It's different cultural like events, different like everything informing these other movies is different than something made here. So when you remake something, you lose part of what makes that movie, you know, like what, what is it saying? You yeah. lose that. With an, uh, to give an example that I can speak of since I just covered it, 
the the short story by Clive Barker, The Forbidden, is based in the UK. It's I think it's uh, Liverpool, but it's like a class-based thing because Clive Barker is British and wrote that story then. When Bernard Rose adopted it into Candyman, uh, you know, one of our favorites, he had to change the the like social commentary and changed it no from idea. class to be a more race thing. Candyman in the Forbidden, the short story by Clive Barker, is not a black man. Wow, it's, yeah, I yeah. had no idea that that was all a creation from Bernard Rose, who himself is a British guy. So it's not like it's an American director taking this British story and being like, "I'll I'll make it more in line with the U- U.S.'s history." It was a British guy who was somehow able to understand the United States' history and historical context and and make this his movie about race. That's really interesting. And, uh, yeah, for the most part succeeding, there's some discussion about, you know, but I think a lot of people think it's a solid commentary. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. The, I didn't, the fact that I've, and yeah, you say like the fact that a British, it's not even just like, oh, he what knew the Civil War. Exists. It's like, yeah, that, but also he knew Cabrini Green. Yeah. Like that's that's inner the, city I politics. I think that's the, st- and... yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. That's really fascinating. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, so it can be done. Right. You know, yeah, if you yeah. find the correct parallel. Yeah. But yeah, so reboots, that's another thing. Uh, so like we said, Japan's economy stagnates in the 90s. That's the last decade. So this results in drastic changes to employment and industry. There's now a focus on more flexible jobs versus long-term employment. We see that here now, too, after our crash in 2008. Think of how much more... F- gig economy. Gig economy, sharing <laughs> economy, Uber, stuff like that. Good thing healthcare is still tied to employment, though. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Love it here. Uh Japan, after World War II, had such quick development, too, after their defeat. like That's what you mentioned, their economic boom, that it was kind of upheld as something to be really admired, if not straight up fetishized. The idea of, like, Japan is this, like, perfect nation of production. Look how much stuff that they're making. It's amazing. Yeah. And that mythical peak of theirs it makes this crash even more traumatizing. After all the repression that has to be done after World War II to even more so align with these Western standards of being, it would have seemed super worth it during this boom when everything is great. But in light of this crash, there's questioning looking back on this myth of progress after the war like did we really progress or was it all just kind of an illusion yeah because i believe that after world war ii the u.s kept troops in japan for i forget for how long for a long time because we we barred them from uh creating a military Mm -hmm. service which i think maybe was just changed like in recent years but uh we were like, yeah, you guys went to war with us. You're not allowed to have a military anymore. We'll defend you as need be, which helped them with that economic boom because, like, then they didn't have to put money into military. They could put it into technological developments and everything. But uh, a product of that is Japan's culture, especially compared to other Asian countries around them having a more Western influence, especially then in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Whereas now I think, you know, South Korea is the same kind of thing. We have U.S. troops there and uh, their culture is also more Westernized, maybe, quote mm-hmm. unquote. But I think that was a, a big case in Japan in the 80s. Yeah. And I think the one of the biggest things we look at that becomes super Western about Japan is this idea of a work culture, work ethic. Uh, Which they took and ran with. Yeah, that's oh, a lot of what's going to inform these kids in these movies is these standards placed on work Oh man! after World War II. I only know from stuff that I've read, just like people's comments online on Reddit and such. But yeah, uh, I don't know if it's still the case, but just the, the work ethic and the standards and um, pressure putting on uh, em- employees in Japan, mm-hmm. just late hours, sleeping at desks. I, I, I know that Japan has a high... Si- like they still smoke a lot of cigarettes probably for stress relief i forget it, it, japan china for sure okay um i forget if that's still the case in japan yeah yeah but and- uh yeah so all this like progress and the idea of like we're working really hard and we're like we're ex- a success after the war that also implies this overcoming of japan 
also being a victim of, of World War II after the war, you know, the bombing and then, yes, our occupation of their country. Mm-hmm. It's like that. But then also we have to reckon with our actions during World War II, wartime atrocities and being part of the, the axis. Yeah. So the kid then in Japanese horror is representing these conflicts, victim versus perpetrator. They are often a misunderstood victim before they're revealed in the end to still be monstrous. So I think the best scene that demonstrates that is uh, in Ringu and the American remake of The Ring, which again, this is what you lose in an American remake. You have Sadako who dies in the well Mm -hmm. and the main character in Ringo is trying to understand how this child died and they find Sadako's body in the well, realize she was murdered and they, they cradle her decomposed body. And we have this moment where we think everything is fine. We've given her the catharsis she deserves. We realize she was a victim. We feel bad for her. But in the end, Sadako is still kills uh, i think it's her ex-husband through the the videotape she's yeah. still like she's still going to continue her curse so while we have empathy for her and while she's a victim she is still a perpetrator of this violence she's both and it's confusing and weird kind of like how japan's i you know um identification after world war ii is really confusing yeah. because while they were on the they were allied with the nazis Hiroshima still happened. It's yeah. like, it is, it's, it's, it's confusing and it's hard to reckon with. So Japan's forced surrender after World War II also becomes intertwined with the idea of the child victim imagery of children. And that's where we get Sadako and her name being so interesting because have you, did you study Sadako and the thousand paper cranes in school at all? Oh no. Oh really? Okay. Oh. But she was a girl, a real life girl in Japan who was diagnosed with leukemia as a side effect of radiation after Hiroshima. And one of her roommates at the hospital told her about the long-standing Japanese belief that anyone who folds 1,000 paper cranes would be granted a wish. And so Sadako began folding cranes with the hope of recovering from her disease. Sadly, although she folded some 1,300 cranes, she died on October 25th, 1955. Oh, this does sound familiar. Yeah, as like a symbol of peace. And there's like a memorial for her and people leave paper cranes at it. And it then isn't a coincidence that Sadako shares her name with the Sadako in Ringu. It's like reappropriating this image of this child that Japan upholds as this image of their victimhood after the war Mm -hmm. and it twists it to then be monstrous which i think is really fascinating okay yeah that makes sense yes so speaking of going back to the crash to the lost decade this change in industry in the workforce is ultimately going to mean change for the family so j-horror films often are depicting families falling apart just like ours and the 80s and onward there's this anxiety over the family unit since the mid 90s japan has had one of the lowest birth rates in the world Ooh, there is yeah. cultural anxiety over children and yeah that's why there's such a fixation on them i think isn't the term graying out where it's like your population, your population is so old you know it's mm-hmm. yeah it like can't sustain itself yeah like the the largest portions of your population are getting older and you're not making enough new people to re- replace them mm-hmm. which was uh less so of a problem with us because of millennials mm-hmm. it was another big generation to kind of help replace the aging boomers mm-hmm. but uh had millennials not been as big as we are yeah like social security and stuff would be in an even bigger problem i'm curious what's gonna happen when millennials are older well, I don't think we've had that many kids. Uh oh yeah, because we have lower birth rates. Yeah. We have kids later. I don't know. Yeah. Guess we'll see. We'll see. Check back with us in twenty years. Yeah. So there is this now extra emphasis on investing in children as the future of national progress because it's so <laughs> crucial. Daycares and schools become the norm again. It's another Western thing that's incorporated into 
Japanese society. In 1998, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is ratified in Japan the same year Ringu is released. I think it's interesting to note. Mm -hmm. And research from this time by sociologists reveals how much physical and mental health problems students have as a result of stress. You mentioned that earlier. And so now at, you know, late 90s, there is some acknowledgement that kids can be victims of Japanese society itself and that trauma isn't always coming from outside. Mm. So think of we be like Japanese child victim of World War II, of it's always other things yeah. of Westernization, but it is now like we can look at how Japan has restructured itself and there is some like reckoning within Japan of like it is our we are harming our kids as well and it, this says research uh, from this time by sociologists is it Japanese sociologists yes. okay so it's not like American sociologists doing some kind of study no and, no no okay, this okay. is like this is the reason I brought up like um, yeah, that UN convention, mm -hmm. it, like that being ratified in Japan and yeah, these stuff, this is like Japan realizing we're doing this ourselves to mm -hmm. our kids. On an average school day, I get up at seven and go to school at eight. School finishes at five and after that I go to cramming school. On the way back from cramming school, I grab a bite to eat and arrive home at about 9 p.m. We are forced to study. There's hardly any free time left as I have to do homework. There's also a wave of violent youth crimes in Japan in the 90s and 2000s, and it's framed as like normal kids just snapping, and the biggest rise in juvenile crime is by kids under 14. Jeez. And this is worldwide news. Everyone is talking about this weird like rash of violent crime by kids in Japan, and this further is destroying the image of Japan as like a nation of progress and the child as a model of national progress, like children being the future. It's yeah. like, oh my God. Not this future, please. Yeah, exactly. And side note, um, Battle Royale. Yeah. Oh shit. That would be right around this time, huh? Yeah. Because that movie opens with yeah. a montage of like the kids are out of control. Yeah, the whole premise of Battle Royale is like, you kids have fucking you're so crazy that we're just gonna send you to this island and deal with you that way. Yeah. Wow. A fourteen year old decapitated a younger boy and placed his head on the school gate. A seventeen year old hijacked a bus and stabbed commuters with a huge carving knife. What has caused this recent spate of murder in a country whose young people are traditionally at the heart of a peaceful, ordered society? Juan the series, which is the grudge, and it's, oh my god, there's there's so much. Juan, everything. I, I was looking at just the lore of it. Wow. <laughs> it's so much. I went and watched the, the grudge, like the original, because I had never seen it. Okay. I only was familiar with the American remake. So I went and watched the original and that movie takes place like in media res, like after the release of two straight to video movies that were like so popular that then they made the grudge. It is like a continuation of stuff. Oh, really? It's nuts. I mean, it still makes sense out of context, yeah. but it's kind of crazy how it's like another chapter in this story. So what is this franchise, for lack of a better term, is is Juon? Yeah. And it has movies and I'm guessing mangas. All kinds of, yeah. Oh, man. It's so much. So, so much. But that series is a curse as the result of a family breakdown. It's a dad who murders his wife, son, and cat. Aww. Yeah. And the curse is then infectious. It spreads. Like, if you go to the house where this murder happened, you're cursed. The original curse in the movie, too, the way it starts spreading is... Or no, it's okay. So this is where it gets it gets complicated. I believe it begins. This isn't in the movie. It's in like one of the direct-to-video things where like the curse is shown to be like the the like origin of it has to do with the little kid and its teacher coming to check on him because he hasn't been at school. He's like a dropout. Oh, okay. Or like he just or not a he just hasn't been attending school. It's truant. But around the same time, um there's data that students refusing to attend school who are called they they refer to it as toko kyohi 
which basically means it's a student not attending school for a certain amount of days for reasons that aren't health or poverty. It's like kids just, I'm not going to school. Okay. Yeah. And that skyrockets in the 90s by 97. One in 53 middle school students is categorized as Toko Kiyohi. They just don't go to school. A 14-year-old student abducted 11-year-old Jun Hase from school and took him into nearby hills. He then tortured, strangled, and decapitated him. The 14-year-old killer placed a note in the mouth of his victim's severed head. In another note he wrote, I want to take revenge on the compulsory education system that has made me transparent and invisible. These were sentiments shared by many Japanese school children. There's statements by a sociologist, I think, Shoko Yoniyama, from some of these students who are categorized as such, basically saying, we refuse to go to school because it's too intense and fuck that. Like we're resisting the school structure because mm. this is not a way to be a kid. So I, it's interesting that the little kid in the grudge Toshio is like the origin of this curse. And we have someone coming to visit his home because he's not in school. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So he's this kind of monstrous embodiment of that. He's the little cat, the cat boy in the trailers. I feel like that's the one, if anyone knows The Grudge, they know the little kid who meows like a cat. Okay. All this millennial J-horror is children who for so long either haven't been recognized as victims or have been used, their victimhood has been used as a way to promote this identity as of Japan as victim. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's them rebelling. It's them threatening to destroy this system that you know, uses them to uphold this perfect image of progress. Yeah. It's interesting. So yeah, we'll talk about J-horror remakes in some other episode because we'll be revisiting a lot of this stuff. I guess we'll wrap it out by just talking more broadly about, you know, new millennium horror up till now. There's an interesting trend of children's fears becoming adults' fears. So the Babadook is um, this child being afraid of the Babadook who's in the book and the, it, that becoming the adult's fear as well. That becoming real and affecting the adult. Same with Stranger Things is something that the kids are afraid of and the adults dismissing it. But then it eventually comes to affect the adults as well. Yeah. So it's I, I think it's really fascinating that we I have... I guess even uh, It, although that was, you know, obviously written much earlier. It's yeah. kind of... It's, it's the kids' fears becoming real for they themselves as an adult. Yes. You know? Yeah. But yeah, it's it's even though something like It was obviously written in the 80s, maybe it, it is interesting to look into, well, why now are we feeling so attached to this movie? Yeah, not only why is it getting remade now, but why did, was it such a big so hit? So Why did it resonate Why so is Stranger well? Things so successful? Yeah. Why are these horror or horror adjacent things with kids in them who aren't creepy we're not really we don't really have like the creepy kid right now is not super in vogue but we do have lots of kid centric horror where the kids are victims and the adults don't listen to them mm -hmm. i think is the biggest common denominator in those things it's kids rebelling and kids being shown it's, it's kids being shown to be correct and yeah. kids being right and i think um there's this implication that dismissing the fears of children is going to be detrimental to all of us. And to me, that really reflects nicely with where we're at now. We're in this era of like child activists. Um, you think of the Parkland kids, uh, March for Life. Um, these are like children mobilizing on a national scale saying we're afraid and adults are ignoring us. So yeah, and that that's all I got for you. Sorry oh, that's if, it? Yeah, that's it. Oh, man. Sorry if I kind of gloss over New <laughs> Millennium, or not New Millennium, but like present day contemporary horror. It's just, you know, um, there's a lot of episode. <laughs> yeah, and it's always harder to, uh, to talk about things without years of it's, distance. It is. You know? It's a lot harder. Yeah. It, it's hard to situate the things that are happening now in a historical context since they're happening now. Mm -hmm. In five years, we can probably look back and be like, oh, why'd, why'd Stranger Things happen? Mm -hmm. But it's a little more difficult now. Mm -hmm. Holy shit, man. I feel like you learned me a lot of good stuff. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Cool. I, I, I was sitting here thinking while we were talking, I was like, I think I'm going to get a book on the Spanish Civil War and read about that. It's fascinating. Yeah. That, the, 
honestly part of the reason this episode took me so long to put together or these episodes plural I just kept getting sidetracked and learning about unrelated uh historical things yeah just branching out Mm -hmm. like oh guess I'll follow this yeah (laughs) Like I was learning about um, styles of Japanese dance, which is uh, related to Sadako, but it wasn't related enough to like my notes here to include. But just the way that she moves is really evocative of both traditional Japanese dance and contemporary dance that was basically specifically invented as like a protest against traditional dance she's like both things which wow. i think is I was like fuck that's so cool but this is already so long <laughs> and i was just sitting there watching videos of dan people dancing and <laughs> i know man sometimes when you do research for stuff because it will happen to me with kill counts too is you wind up like you know I'm fucking making a kill count on Ice Cream Man and I wind up watching the Wouldn't You Like to Be a Pepper 2 commercial. Oh, yeah. Well, that makes sense because that's David Naughton. Yeah, but it's like you, you you just stop and you pause for a second. And you're like, how did I, I get here? I don't need to be doing this. But it's like, it's like, I don't need, but also it's informing stuff. And now I know about this stuff. Yeah. So, and knowledge is always fun to have. Yeah. Uh, I love this. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope you all, all liked it. Let's have cool, chill conversation about it. Um, I'm not a historian. I'm a fan of horror movies who makes a podcast, so pardon me if I get anything totally fucking wrong. Yeah. Uh, I'm just good at putting together book reports, essentially. (laughs) So please don't yell at me. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, our job is to learn about things and then try to relay the things uh, to you in an excited and interesting way. Yeah, and if anything is like super wrong, that'll always be something where in like the next episode I'll address all mm-hmm. of that because I hate the idea of perpetuating a fake understanding of something or like a misunderstanding of something. Yeah. Yeah, I take that seriously. <laughs> For sure. So, all right. Cool. I think next week we're going to have a chill ass episode where we talk about Halloween. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Someone on Twitter, I will shout you out in the next episode. I just didn't write your handle down, but you suggested October would be a great time to just do a chill episode about Halloween candy and costumes we've worn in the past. And mm-hmm. that sounds really relaxing. Sounds like a call to Cynthia's in order. To oh, help me get remember. some pictures and stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. My mom will help me remember yeah. stuff I've dressed It wise. sounds, yeah, very um, much like I don't have to do research for it. Love it. Which is good because that's around our convention and such. Uh-huh, yeah. By the <laughs> way, we're going to be at Scaracon. I will put... Will, uh, will that have happened already? I don't think so. No, it won't. No. Okay, so we'll be at Scaricon, Um, I think this weekend when this comes out. Check Eight, the link in the... 18th, 18th and 19th? And 19th, yeah. In Rochester, New York. Yeah, so hit that up. Scaricon. also, since it's still October, you can still pre-order the Dead Meat Collector's Edition of In Search of Darkness, an 80s horror documentary that's like, what, four and a half hours it's long? so long. Yeah. yeah Everyone's in it. Yeah, everyone's in it, mm-hmm. including us. So uh, the Dead Meat Collector's Edition has more of us in it. So get that, pre-order it. Should be links or information in the thing. Yeah, you can't pre-order it after October 31st. Yeah. That's it. It like doesn't exist after that. And some people are like, well, will you have it at your tables at conventions? Nope. No, we, we won't. I'm sorry. Nope. It's, it's out of our control. But check that out. You can follow Dead Meat on social media at Dead Meat James on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Carebeck, C-A-R-E-B-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, DeadMeatStore.com. Yep. Feel free to hit up the podcast with any feedback or compliments at yeah. DeadMeatPod at gmail.com. And until next time, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. This has been the Dead Meat Podcast. Yeah.